Thank you, Dr. Gleave, and good morning, everyone. So it's a real pleasure to have the opportunity to speak to you about one of the things that's actually been quite puzzling to me over my residency, and that's this whole mysterious cloud of BPH, and specifically looking at not just what it is, but really the hows and the whys around this very common condition. Let's see, next slide. Before we begin, just a little tribute to Dr. McNeely. The prostate is the sun around which all satellites of urology orbit, except of course, pediatric urology. I like this quote and hopefully today's talk won't disappoint Dr. McNeely because we got a lot to talk about when it comes to the prostate. So our objectives today around BPH are to first briefly review the natural history of BPH and the current treatment landscape for the condition. And then we're gonna transition over to talk about the different hypotheses for the development of BPH, including altered local androgen milieu, prostatic inflammation, and the stem cell reawakening hypothesis. What exactly is BPH? I mean, BPH in the simplistic point of view is just benign enlargement of the prostate, which then causes bladder outlet obstruction and associated lower urinary tract symptoms in a male. But if we dive into this a little deeper, BPH can be identified based on histology under the microscope, where we see stromal hyperplasia and also epithelial hyperplasia. We can consider BPH as an absolute weight of the prostatic specimen. And most importantly to the urologist, it's the symptoms that this all generates. And the important thing with symptoms is symptoms is not just a matter of how big the prostate is, but it's a matter of how the prostate interacts with the bladder and what kind of configuration the prostate, prostate takes on as it grows and how much of an element of functional obstruction it can create. If we look at the simple mechanics of prostate enlargement, a lot of work was done in this in the 1980s where researchers looked at prostate size on autopsy specimens. And this is one of the most commonly cited studies looking at this. And it included about a thousand human autopsies across various age ranges. If we look at the percent of prostates that exhibit histologic evidence of BPH, we can see that by age 80 to 90, almost 80 to 90 percent of these autopsy specimens have histologic evidence of BPH. If we look at absolute weight of the prostate, a young adult's prostate on average is gonna weigh around 20 grams and by age 80, it nearly doubles. So it almost looks like based on this data that BPH is very ubiquitous and almost do I dare say part of the normal male aging pattern. What does that mean for lower urinary tract symptoms? If we look at studies that have followed men and their LUTs over long periods of time, we can see that AUA symptom scores or IPSSs tend to worsen as men get older. And this is urologic dogma, as we all know. In line with this, the likelihood of needing BPH treatment also worsens with age, and the same goes for the likelihood of needing a TERP. So this sets us up for a pretty nice correlation where we can see prostate size gets bigger with age. So does the worsening of lower urinary tract symptoms and the need for ultimate surgical treatment of BPH. Furthermore, we've learned a lot more about the influence of prostate size, um, clinical trials looking at BPH. And this is one of the landmark trials, the PLESS study, which looked at patients with BPH randomized placebo versus finasteride. If we do subgroup analyses focusing on the placebo group, we can see that as prostate size gets bigger, the likelihood of progression of BPH in the study defined by AUR, urinary retention or need for BPH surgery, increases dramatically. And the addition of finasteride actually almost completely mitigates this risk, especially in the larger prostate size group. The same sort of a trend is seen for PSA tertiles, likely from a similar mechanism. We put together this epidemiological and RCT data. I think we can gather a few important points surrounding the fate of the prostate. The first point is that the prostate size will tend to increase with age. So does the likelihood of developing lower urinary tract symptoms as men get older. I think we can conclude that not every man with BPH related LUTs will require treatment but the likelihood of this does also increase with age. And the exact nature of the lower urinary tract symptoms secondary to BPH depends on how the bladder interacts with the prostate. We often see Venn diagrams like this published 
where, you know, in a hypothetical number situation, you take all group of men over age 40, over half of them will have histologic evidence of BPH. In that group, some will have actual absolute increase in prostatic weight or prostatic enlargement. Some will have evidence of functional bladder outlet obstruction as a result of the BPH. And then the majority of men who have lower urinary tract symptoms will usually have histologic BPH, but there certainly is a small proportion that will not have this, who have LUTs due to other causes like bladder dysfunction, overactive bladder, and um, stricture disease and other causes. One of the other epidemiological considerations of BPH is the genetic predisposition. And epidemiological data will suggest that there is a very strong genetic predisposition for BPH um, to the point where if you have a first degree relative who's had BPH surgery, your lifeline likelihood of needing it is up to 66% compared to 17% in controls. Despite this reproducible genetic predisposition in epidemiological studies, genomic sequencing though has been pretty low yield in looking at a genetic factor res responsible for BPH. And the mutational burden in the disease is actually quite low here as shown by the orange bar um, compared to prostate cancer, which is shown in gray. So much lower genomic uh, alterations in BPH and no identifiable driver mutations as of yet in the disease process. What tools do we have currently in our toolbox to address BPH-related symptoms? This is a summary figure from the most recent CUA guidelines. And what it shows um, is that in the treatment algorithm of BPH, the first step, obviously, lifestyle management. Then as we go down the medical therapy road, the most common first lines we know is alpha blockers um, to lower bladder outlet resistance. And in larger glands, we can add 5-alpha reductase inhibitors to help with prostate gland shrinkage. The CUA guidelines go into a little bit more depth about adding adjuncts like anti-muscarinics or beta-3 agonists to address irritative symptoms from the bladder. And they talk about addition of possible PD-5 inhibitors if there's concurrent erectile dysfunction. Common theme here is if there's treatment failure in the medical therapy landscape, we usually move on to surgery in the form of a TERP and others. The same treatment paradigm is echoed by the AUA guidelines, although it goes into less detail around um, bladder-directed treatments. But what it boils down to is in the urologist toolbox, we really got alpha blockers, 5-alpha reductase inhibitors, low-dose sialis, bladder-directed treatments, and in rare situations, you can consider desmopressin for nocturnal polyuria. One common theme with all these treatments is that most of these are not really targeting the underlying pathophysiology of BPH, perhaps other than 5-alpha reductase inhibitors. They're all really doing damage control to address symptoms as a result of BPH. And there really is a shortage of treatments that address the underlying pathophysiology of the disease process. This slide helps us segue into the next portion of the talk. It's really, why does BPH actually occur? Why do we see this benign prostatic enlargement? And this is a process that is really quite perplexing because from an evolution point of view, it doesn't really make sense why we'd see prostatic enlargement. Why would we see cellular energy and ATP and other resources dedicated towards enlargement of a gland that becomes functionally less important as men get older? Before we can go into some of the hypotheses around why this may be happening, I think we should have a quick look at the histology of BPH and what prostate tissue looks like under the microscope. As we all know, prostate tissue is divided, or prost the prostate itself is divided into different zones. And the heart of BPH action is felt to be the transition zone, which is where the prostate epithelium is in direct contact with the, with the urethra. Within this transition zone, if we look at sections of it under the microscope, we can see that the prostate gland is composed of interspersed glandular tissue with the interspersed stroma that consists of usually smooth muscle cells. A basic hematoxylin and eosin section will show us these isolated glands with epithelium lining and then stroma here, which is mostly smooth muscle, 
And if we zoom in on the epithelial layer, we can see that there is a basal layer, which is in direct contact with the stroma and basement membrane, and then a luminal layer, which is going to be in contact with the actual lumen of the glands, as the name implies. This is important because there will be differences in these cell phenotypes as we look at more of their handling of androgens and their responses to cellular stress. The first hypothesis that really came to light around the development of BPH is the androgen hypothesis. This was a very attractive hypothesis because of all the work that was going in to look at androgen handling at the prostate in the 1960s and 70s. Based on our knowledge back then, researchers knew that androgens are a key prerequisite for prostatic development and growth. And there's lots of clinical correlative data out there that points to a clear role for androgens in the pathogenesis of BPH. For example, we know that young men who undergo voluntary castration in some cultures do not develop BPH. We know that men with congenital 5-alpha reductase deficiency do not form any meaningful prostate glands. We know from ADT studies that androgen deprivation can reduce prostate volume by up to 30%. 30%. Likewise, testosterone replacement therapy can increase prostate size. And 5-alpha reductase therapy or inhibitor therapy can improve BPH symptoms and reduce prostate size. This all points to potential role for androgens, but the underlying question is whether androgens are actually the driving force behind the initial pathogenesis and development of BPH. The irony behind androgens and BPH is that if androgens were actually driving BPH, we would expect testosterone levels to actually be rising with age if there was an alteration in overall systemic or serum testosterone levels. But we know in lots of studies looking at male aging, the natural history of testosterone levels is to decrease with age. And this again would not be congruent with the changes we would expect if a systemic, um, systemic problem with testosterone handling was driving BPH. Furthermore, if we look at correlative studies that looked at patients with BPH and tried to associate their testosterone levels with their prostate volumes and PSA, we see that there is really no meaningful correlation between prostate volume or PSA across the different baseline testosterone groups in a study like this one. Does this mean that androgens are completely out of the bag when it comes to explaining BPH pathophysiology? Not quite, because we still need to look at whether local alterations in steroid handling at the level of the prostate could explain BPH pathogenesis. A lot of work has gone into trying to understand how different or the different levels of androgen handling and interactions at the, at the prostate. Basically, in a nutshell, this figure tries to summarize some of the data that we have on how steroids are handled. We know that the androgen receptor is predominantly expressed within the stroma and within the luminal epithelial cells of the prostate, again, the ones that are in contact with the glands, the lumen of the glandular tissue. Relatively lower expression of AR and lunabasal epithelium. Testosterone acts on the androgen receptor at the stroma to cause stromal proliferation and secretion of growth factors. We also see a similar action of testosterone on the androgen receptor within the luminal epithelium that also drives proliferation. Testosterone can also diffuse into the basal epithelium and drive conversion to DHT via the action of 5-alpha reductase. And DHT, as we know, is a much more potent form of testosterone. Um, that's about 10 times more potent compared to testosterone and can further drive uh, BPH. The other factor is the contribution of testosterone's partner in crime, which is estradiol. We know that aromatase, which converts testosterone to estradiol, is expressed from the prostatic stroma, and estradiol can have varying effects depending on uh, which cell type it's acting on. The next step that researchers worked on with BPH is to see if there's differences in prostatic testosterone and DHT levels. And there really hasn't been much correlation 
or a reliable correlation that's been demonstrated if we look at prostatic levels of androgens. This was one of the more recent studies that looked at prostate biopsies and tried to look at levels of testosterone and DHT in the transition zone. And they showed a positive correlation between testosterone levels and prostate volume. And this was testosterone and DHT levels within the transition zone. Although this study did show a positive correlation, we should keep in mind that this correlation has not been reliably reproduced within the literature. The other avenue that's been investigated is whether there's differences in the androgen receptor at genomic level in BPH compared to normal patients. One study did show that in surgical BPH patients, um, that reduction and the CAG repeat length on the androgen receptor gene does reduce the risk of needing BPH surgery. We know that decreased CAG repeat length does lead to increased transcriptional activity of the androgen receptor. This alteration, though, has not been reliably reproduced in the literature. Another study looked at whole-up specimens and demonstrated that there was increased expression of the ARV7 transcriptional variant in whole of patients compared to incidental BPH controls. But again, this was a very small difference in expression levels. Again, possible signal leading, suggesting alterations in androgen receptor genetics within BPH specimens, but nothing that's been reliably reproduced in the literature. The other hormone that we should talk about in BPH is the contribution of estrogen. And we know that estrogen and aromatase are expressed within prostatic tissues, and that estrogen can have proliferative effects on prostatic cell lines and in vitro studies. Data looking at estrogen levels in BPH um, has suggested that there might be increased estrogen levels in BPH tissues compared to controls. This study used healthy organ donors who are obviously a fair bit younger and their BPH counterparts, but did show increased expression, uh, or not expression, increased levels of estrogen within the prostatic stroma and epithelium compared to the normal controls. Interestingly, there was actually reduced levels of DHT in BPH patients compared to the normal controls, which again shows some of the heterogeneity in the studies looking at this. One of the tools that we can use in studying estrogen clinically is that we have a lot of agents that are available that target the estrogen receptor and aromatase from breast cancer literature. This was an RCT that looked at um, adamestane, which is an aromatase inhibitor in BPH patients. And they randomized 300 patients to either placebo, low or high dose aromatase inhibitor. And they looked at hormone profiles and symptom improvement. Interestingly, despite generating the expected alterations in the hormonal serum milia as expected with the aromatase inhibitor with decreased estrogen levels and increased testosterone, this group was unable to show any significant difference in symptoms in BPH patients who were treated with low and high dose aromatase inhibitor, which suggests that perhaps we're not able to generate or observe an effect, a positive effect on symptoms with aromatase inhibitor. But the thing we have to keep in mind is we don't know if this, any possible benefit of lower estrogens could be negated by the corresponding increase in testosterone levels from the aromatase inhibitor. The last hormone that I want to discuss is progesterone. And progesterone levels have been detected within prostate tissues, but it's usually orders of magnitude less than estrogen and BPA and not BPH and testosterone. Um, in vitro cell line studies have looked at the impact of progesterone on BPH cell lines. And they do show that in BPH cell lines made to express progesterone receptors, there is a decrease in cell proliferation and there is an alteration in cell cyclin expression, which suggests that progesterones could be impacting the progression of the cell cycle in, BP, in BPH cell lines. The other data in support of this is some genome association studies have identified progesterone receptor alterations in BPH patients compared to normal controls. And the progesterone receptor has been identified in transitional zone biopsy specimens on immunohistochemistry. 
So overall, when it comes to the androgen hypothesis, I think there is in vivo and in vitro data that implicates different steroids in the potential pathogenesis of BPH. The challenge is we haven't been able to identify an inciting factor that would drive an alteration in the androgen or steroid milia to produce prostatic hyperplasia. And it's unclear whether uh, altered activity of steroids is due to some other process going on, whether the primary uh, pathophysiology is due to something going wrong with the steroid handling. The next hypothesis I wanted to go through is the inflammatory hypothesis of BPH. And this was a largely serendipitous hypothesis where researchers noticed that a lot of BPH tissue on biopsies and TERP specimens had corresponding inflammation noted. And one of the studies that looked at this was actually a trial called the REDUCE trial, which was a trial that was looking at chemo prevention of prostate cancer with 5-alpha reductase inhibitors. And although the trial was looking at a completely different question, the investigators noticed that a fair number of these patients had actual incidental note of inflammation on their baseline prostate biopsies, up to 75%. And when they looked at baseline IPSS and prostate volume in these patients, they noticed that there tended to be a significantly higher baseline IPSS in patients who had larger uh, inflammatory gradings based on simple histology compared to those who had lesser grades of inflammation. And the same went for prostate volume. Further work trying to characterize inflammation of the prostate tried to look at different cell types that infiltrated the BPH tissues. This study used tissue microarrays and looked at TURP specimens and open prostatectomy specimens to look at the different cell types that were infiltrating BPH. They showed that about 80% of BPH tissues had infiltration of T cells, 50% had B cell infiltration, and 80% had macrophages localized within the TMA specimens. In line with this, other studies have looked at cytokine expressions, and there's evidence that cytokines like NF-kappa B, IL-17 are upregulated in BPH tissues compared to incidental. BPH specimens, say, for example, with this study that shows upregulation of NF-kappa B compared to incidental BPH noted on radical prostatectomy patients. Furthermore, um, there's evidence suggesting upregulation of VEGF-related pathways in BPH tissue, where we see uh, upregulation of VEGF receptor, the BPH stroma, and also upregulation of VEGF in BPH, which suggests that this might be an explanation for, um, for increased vascularity and even perhaps gross hematuria in BPH. The way an inflammatory hypothesis of BPH would plan out is you presumably have some trigger for prostatic inflammation that then leads to immune cell recruitment. Ms. immune cells are recruited, they release inflammatory cytokines and growth factors that drive wound healing and act on local prostatic tissues to lead to prostatic hypertrophy. It's a hypothesis that overall would make sense. The missing link, I think, in the inflammatory hypothesis is what the potential trigger would be for an inflammatory cascade. Um, potential triggers that have been hypothesized include bacteria, viral remediated inflammation, sterile urine reflux, and perhaps even local tissue hypoxia. The only potential trigger that I've seen evidence for is bacteria. And this study looked at bacterial growth in TURP specimens. And they showed that bacteria can be cultured in over half of TURP specimens, um, which suggests that bacteria are often infiltrated in BPH tissue. Despite this, the group was not able to show a difference in subjective inflammatory scores between prostates that had bacterial growth compared to those that did not. But they did dive a little bit farther and they actually characterized the microbiome 
uh, within each of these TURP specimens. And they did find a significant difference in the proportion of cells that had DNA damage as evidenced by phosphorylated histone H2AX um, in patients who had predominantly proteobacteria-based microbiomes. And proteobacteria are the principal uropathogenic bacteria like E. coli. So it suggests that the microbiome could be a player in driving uh, prostatic cell damage and potentially inflammation that could drive BPH. Another possible trigger in association for inflammation and BPH is metabolic syndrome. There have been multiple studies which have looked at the association of metabolic syndrome and BPH. And these have, and multiple of these studies have shown a significant association between the present metabolic syndrome and the risk for developing lower urinary tract symptoms. Um, the most common associated aspect of this is actually obesity and abdominal girth but also poor glycemic control and high insulin levels have been linked to development of lower urinary tract symptoms. Potential mechanisms for this include increased inflammatory cell infiltration to the prostate as a result of you know, increased, um, increased obesity and uh, adipocytes, altering the inflammatory and systemic milieu. A direct proliferative action of higher insulin levels as a result of insulin resistance in the prostatic stroma and perhaps alterations in the systemic hormonal milieu as a result of metabolic syndrome. And in line with some of this, these hypotheses, we see that prostate cells in vitro, at least, are quite responsive to insulin-derived growth factor. And this study on the right-hand side shows an association between the number of components of metabolic syndrome that patients have and the subjective inflammatory scores on prostate tissue which suggests a possible cause for prostatic inflammation and a link between metabolic syndrome and inflammation within the prostate. The last hypothesis that I wanted to go over today is the stem cell hypothesis of BPH. The stem cell hypothesis is probably one of the more complicated ones, and it really gained light in the 1970s when researchers hypothesized that pluripotent stem cells existed within the prostatic epithelium. They came about these hypotheses from studies looking at androgen deprivation within the rat prostate. And it was quite amazing to researchers then that if prostate cells, or if the rat prostate was exposed to androgen deprivation with castration, even from prolonged periods of time, the prostate could almost completely repopulate. And that suggested to them that there's likely some population of pluripotent stem cells that exist in the prostate epithelium or stroma that are able to completely regenerate in the prostate once androgens are replaced. Later studies looking at murine models, um, we see more so in the molecular medicine era, actually showed that they're able to isolate prostate epithelial stem cells and demonstrate their ability to differentiate into prostate tissue. One of the more recent studies that looked at this uh, was actually published in Cell in 2017. And this research group worked off of human specimens in normal prostates that were taken at the time of cystectomy. And they used lineage tracing with mitochondrial DNA expression and laser capture microdissection to identify prostate stem cells and start to identify markers for them within the basal layer um, based off of this microdissection. And they actually identified a marker called DLK1 um, as a pretty specific marker for prostate stem cells from the basal epithelium. And they use that marker to take the basal fraction of the epithelium from cell sorting and isolated basal epithelial cells into DLK negative and positive cell or cell sets, and then cultured these cells in vitro. And they showed that the DLK1 positive group is actually able to form mature prostate glands in vitro and maintains expression patterns compatible with the basal epithelium as evidenced by CK5 expression and the luminal epithelium as evidenced by PSA expression. In contrast, the basal cells that were DLK1 negative did not form any meaningful prostate glands and in fact start to show evidence of apoptosis after a couple of passages in cell culture 
as evidenced by caspase expression. So this all suggests that prostate stem cells do indeed exist and are able to be isolated and grown in vitro. How does the stem cell hypothesis tie into BPH? Um, John McNeil was a pathologist at Stanford who was also working around the same time in the 1970s. And he examined a lot of prostate tissue. And he felt that there could be some alteration of the prostate stroma that can reawaken these stem cells. And he just made that hypothesis by examining different prostate sections under the microscope and noted that there tended to be alterations in prostate stromal volume in the earlier stages of the disease. In line with this, quantitative image analysis studies have shown that the stromal to epithelial ratio actually is significantly increased in the spectrum of BPH across those who are on pharmacotherapy, those who have prostatectomy, and those who have TURP compared to asymptomatic patients. In this hypothesis, there would be presumably some trigger that would reawaken the stroma. Again, that could be inflammation, urine reflux, changes in protease activity or the hormonal milieu that would then act on a basal epithelial cell that's of the stem cell progeny, say evidence here by the yellow cell. And then this cell would start to repopulate the prostate epithelium. Um, with that hypothesis in mind, researchers then looked at the prostate stroma to see whether there could be alterations on the histopathology level um, that could explain uh, the stroma taking on a phenotype that would then start expressing growth factors to act on the epithelium. One of the things that stood out in these trials is researchers have actually been able to identify infiltration of mesenchymal stem cells within the prostate stroma. And they identified this based on triple marker positivity by CD73, CD90, and CD105, which are actually lymphoid markers that suggest cells of bone marrow origin and cells with mesenchymal stem cell capability. And this study shows triple marker localization in an open prostatectomy specimen. Um, that was done. So this suggests that these cells could actually migrate uh, into the prostate stroma and start to participate in tissue repair and damage repair. Um, further in line with this, other studies have used cell sorting to actually isolate these cells and have shown their plasticity in vitro to differentiate into cell types like fibroblasts and smooth muscle cells in cell culture. So if we try to unify the prostate stem cell hypothesis, Presumably, there'd be some trigger for stromal uh, inductiveness, if we say, whether that's inflammation or tissue damage. This would then lead to recruitment and infiltration of mesenchymal stem cells that would then disrupt the stromal, the normal stromal architecture. And these MSCs would start to secrete growth factors that can then act on epithelial stem cells that can cause them to reawaken and start to generate glandular uh, hyperplasia. This would then create this episodic cycle where we get repeated insults on the prostate. It will then lead to further recruitment of MSCs and then further uh, propagation of the stem cell population leading to prostate enlargement and presumably symptoms thereafter as a result of the BPH. So overall, I think what we can take away is that there's multiple hypotheses surrounding BPH, but the challenge is it's been difficult to find a unifying hypothesis and a unifying trigger for the pathophysiology of this disease. I think a part of that stems from the challenges that come from actually studying this disease process in different research models. And there's some unique considerations with BPH that I think we should discuss when it comes to studying the disease process itself. The first thing is prostate sampling comes into play. Certainly there's gonna be differences in TURP tissue versus open prostatectomy tissue versus prostate biopsy tissue. 
And we have to think about the different parts of the prostate that are being sampled, whether we're looking at the peripheral zone versus the actual transitional zone, which is where BPH is hypothesized to begin and perpetuate. The other factor that limits our ability to study BPH is that human prostate tissue is markedly different from murine models. For example, human prostates tend to have a much more well-defined prostate capsule compared to, say, canine models or rodent models. This makes it challenging to alter specific factors and to reproduce BPH in animal models. The other factor is that in vitro studies are also challenging to replicate because we can't accurately replicate the interactions between the prostate stroma and the prostate epithelium. So all these things compound and make it difficult to have a good model to study this disease. I think the challenges that, that accompany studying BPH also explain why we really haven't seen much new advances in medical therapy for BPH, despite how widespread this disease is, how prevalent it is, and the significant negative impacts on quality of life. Because really, there are, have been no new medical therapies that target prostatic growth that have been approved on the market other than five ARIs in the 1990s. Most clinical trials to date have focused on the surgical management of BPH. And, you know, brings the hypothetical point up is, is it easier to simply resect this disease or is it easier to versus studying it? But I think there is a major unmet need in BPH to identify treatments that are going to target the disease at the underlying pathophysiology um, because this will prevent the disease because we want to identify treatments that are going to prevent it from actually progressing Early on, we know the current treat medical treatments for BPH that focus on symptoms and damage control have a lot of side effects and are poorly tolerated, especially in younger men. And BPH-related surgery also has a lot of risks and also is not well tolerated in younger men who often are not looking or who want to avoid the side effects of it, like retrograde ejaculation. Um, so I think the possibility of having a medical treatment that would prevent the progression of the disease at the underlying cause would be something that's well needed uh, in urology. So overall, to conclude my talk, the underlying pathophysiology of BPH, I think even after all the studies that we've gone through, remains incompletely understood. It's likely that alterations within the local hormonal inflammatory stromal milieu uh, are likely contributors to prostatic regrowth. But again, the exact inciting factor for this disease process remains to be determined. As our understanding of BPH pathophysiology improves, we can expect further therapies that will target the underlying disease process and can hopefully lead to development of therapies with improved tolerability and reducing the risk for disease progression. So with that, I'd like to thank Dr. Patterson and Dr. Forbes and Dr. Don for their help and mentorship in putting together this talk. And I think we can transition over to any questions and discussion.